Hello, I'm Rebecca Deschweinitz, and on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board, I'm happy to welcome you to Dialogue Gospel Study for Sunday, January 28th, 2024. This is our first lesson for 2024. As in the past, we'll be roughly following the LDS Church's Come Follow Me schedule for scripture study. This year, that's the Book of Mormon, and we're thrilled to have Grant Hardy starting us off. Dialogue Chair Chris Kimball is co-hosting, and fellow board member Michael Austin is also here running tech for us today. Whether you're a longtime listener or have just found Dialogue Gospel Study, we invite you to check out all that Dialogue offers at our website, dialoguejournal.com. There you can find previous Gospel Study lessons, other offerings like Dialogue Out Loud and Dialogue Book Report, and links to all the great shows in the Dialogue Podcast Network. Uh, available at dialoguejournal.com is also the latest issue of the journal and the entire dialogue archive. That's more than five decades of scholarship, poetry, essays, sermons, fiction, and art. In the very first issue of Dialogue, founder Eugene England wrote, My faith encourages my curiosity and awe. It thrusts me into relationship with all creation and encourages me to enter into dialogue. Faith and curiosity and awe continue to guide the work we do. Please support that work and help us secure the future of the oldest independent Mormon studies journal at the donate link at dialoguejournal.com. Our teacher today, Grant Hardy, is a professor of history and religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. He's written books and articles on early Chinese history as well as Mormon studies. He's the author of Understanding the Book of Mormon, and in addition has edited the Book of Mormon in multiple versions, including the Maxwell Institute Study Edition, and most recently, the Annotated Book of Mormon, produced by Oxford University Press's Bible Division and modeled after the new Oxford Annotated Bible. That's the one that I'm using this year, as I imagine many of us are. Grant has held a variety of ward and state callings and currently serves as a nursery leader. He and his wife, Heather, also teach Institute. As with any Latter-day Saint scripture study class, the views expressed today are those of the individual teacher. They do not necessarily reflect those of the Dialogue Foundation, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or any other organization. If you're live on Zoom today or following along on Facebook, where we are running a live stream, you're invited to post respectful and relevant comments and questions in the chat or comments. Uh, we anticipate incorporating those into a discussion after the official close of today's lesson. Joining us today to offer an opening prayer is Charlotte England, a generous artist, wonderful cook who loves to host in her home, and writer who teaches a class on writing personal history. At 90, and she just celebrated this milestone birthday, Charlotte is living her good life, as Aristotle defines it, an excellent, flourishing, happy life. She made Big D Dialogue possible in the mid-1960s while busy raising six kids, and her open dining table and open house policy has encouraged small D Dialogue all along the way. Grant adds that Charlotte and Jean England were deeply involved with Dialogue from its very beginning at Stanford University in 1966. Thirteen years later, Jean was a professor in the BYU class in which Grant and Heather first met the very first week of their freshman year. They owe them so much. Uh, our closing prayer will be offered by Blair Hodges, a Dialogue Foundation board member. Uh, he's the host, producer, and editor of Fireside with Blair Hodges and a new podcast called Family Proclamations. Both are on the Dialogue Podcast Network. Our dear Father in heaven, we approach thee with gratitude in our hearts for so many things for this earth, for the understanding, for the messages. We thank you for the continuation of the dialogue program that has reached so many people. And we're grateful for the people who keep it alive. And may thy blessings be on Grant this day, that he may convey the message that he desires. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank, thank you, Charlotte. Thanks so much. Okay, Rebecca, is it now just me? I'm ready to go? Okay. Um, so the, the musical piece goes on for 
a little longer. We, but you heard the first three minutes or so, which I think will 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 set a tone for, I hope, for what I'm about to share with you this morning. Let me see if I can start by sharing my screen, which is always a little tricky. Um, I'm looking at two of, this must be the one. Okay. And now I want to go to a full screen, which is, if I go down here, will it do it for me? Oh, there it is. Okay. Let me back this up a little bit. Is everybody looking at a, a full screen thing now? Close enough? Ready to go. Okay. Looks Got good. Okay. okay. Thanks <laughs> for the feedback. I, it, it's always hard to tell over Zoom. Um, Dialogue, a journal of, of Mormon thought, began at Stanford University over 50 years ago. And last fall, I was invited to give a lecture to the LDS community there. The lecture went well enough, I think. But the next day, in an informal discussion, one of the students asked, what are we missing when we read the Book of Mormon? It's a great question and one that I'll try to answer this morning. What follows is a general introduction to the Book of Mormon for Come Follow Me. Though we're a little late out of the gate since it's since it's January 28th. So I'll tie my remarks to the last chapters of First Nephi, which is the reading for this week. I've organized my presentation around five things I wish everyone knew about the Book of Mormon. Um, the first thing is it seems to be carefully crafted rather than haphazard or extemporized, despite its repetitions and, some, and its somewhat awkward diction. Second, the intertextuality can be meaningful. There are lots of biblical allusions and phrases from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they're from the King James Bible. Also, the narrative techniques and themes of the Book of Mormon have a particular kinship with the Deuteronomistic history which is a term scholars use for the narrative portions of the Hebrew Bible between Joshua and 2 Kings. Okay, third thing I wish everyone knew is that the is salvation history matters in addition to the plan of salvation. These are technical terms that could use a little more explanation. The New Testament is characterized by a plan of salvation perspective. I don't mean the preexistence and, and the three degrees of glory, but something more basic that salvation is primarily a matter for individuals who can choose to believe in Christ, to repent of their sins through the atonement and keep the commandments. After we die, we will all be resurrected and judged one by one, after which we will enter into eternal glory or something lesser. That's a New Testament perspective. The Hebrew Bible, by contrast, is mostly focused on salvation history, which is a term from, from scholarship. That is the way that God intervenes in human history in this life with saving acts to reward or punish nations or peoples collectively. That is to reward um, them with land, protection, prosperity, and posterity. The Book of Mormon integrates these two perspectives on salvation in interesting ways. The fourth thing is that there's room for grown-up discussions. We usually read the scriptures in church in in very simplistic ways, as can be seen in how the new Come Follow Me manual uses the same lessons for five-year-olds that it does for 75-year-olds. But the Book of Mormon offers much more to careful readers who are willing to spend some time and dig a little deeper. Okay, fifth and last, we can hear Jesus's voice in its pages. We hear the words of Christ in the four gospels but those were filtered through a couple generations of oral traditions and revisions. In the Book of Mormon, we hear the Lord in conversation with, with prophets more directly than, than in the New Testament, especially since Jesus was something like the general editor, overseeing the writing, editing, preservation, and translation of the text. I'm gonna to try to illustrate each of these observations with examples from this week's reading. So 1 Nephi 16 to 22. I'm more of a book person than a podcast person, so this presentation will be a bit text heavy. 
And the scriptural verses I put up on the screen will be formatted like the Reader's Edition or the Maxwell Institute Edition. So there'll be full page paragraphs with section headings, quotation marks, uh, poetic formatting where that's appropriate. So it will look something like modern translations of the Bible. My new annotated Book of Mormon uses the same formatting, but it's in double columns to save space. So things would be a little harder to, to see if I had used that. All right, first, first thing I wish everyone knew is um, that, that the Book of Mormon is carefully crafted. Um, it was originally dictated without punctuation or breaks other than the book and chapter divisions, but the text provides some internal clues to its structure, which I tried to follow in my reformatting. For instance, inclusios are a common device, and then they're much more significant than chiasmus. Inclusios are defined as repeated words or phrases that set off a, a discrete literary unit, like bookends. So you can see here, if you can see my cursor, um, Nephi is reporting um, the complaints of his brother when he proposes that they all build a ship together, which would be quite a family project. And he says, they, did, uh, they began to murmur against me, and my brethren did complain against me. And then he gives what they say, their actual words in quotation marks. It goes on for a while as they're complaining. And then he ends it by saying, after this manner of language did my brethren murmur and complain against us. So you can see that at the beginning, there's a murmur and there's a complaint. And then at the end, it's squished together to, to provide a, it blocks out the, these, uh, the complaints of his brothers. Actually, there's a little shift too as well. For in the beginning, he says, murmur against me. And in the end, it's murmur and complain against us. He's brought in his, his, his father, Lehi, um, into this as well, sort of um, to show that Lehi and Nephi are on the same team, I guess. It's kind of a, a, a subtle little point. Um, these uh, inclusios happen all the way through the, the Book of Mormon. In, in, in this particular passage, I added the quotation marks but Nephi had already marked off the passage with an inclusio. And these inclusios sometimes occur after a few verses, as, as here. Um, sometimes a few chapters, a chapter, a few, a, something will begin with a, a phrase, and then several chapters later, you see that phrase again as it marks off a unit. And even um, entire books are sometimes marked off by the same things said at the beginning and the end of the book. Okay, next example. After Nephi is commanded to build a ship and his brothers resist, Nephi launches into a lengthy speech that recounts the history of Israel. He signals the main themes of his speech with an introductory verse that quotes his brother's complaints. And here you can say his brothers are saying, we know that, that the people at Jerusalem were all righteous people, and we know that they're a righteous people. And Nephi responds by picking up that phrase, we know, and then he tells him, Here's what you actually know. And you can see I've out, I've highlighted here, you know this and that, and you know this, you know, you know, you know, you also know, you know, he, he actually hits it pretty hard. Um, but this isn't all that happens here. There's more. Over the course of his speech where he recounts the history of Israel, and, and that will go on for 25 verses from, from verse 23 to 47. Over the course of that speech, Nephi will respond to, to his brother's complaints by reversing their assertions and then repeating and recontextualizing several key words of that, that, from that introduction in verse 22, including what they know, you've already seen that, um, but also they complain about uh, the righteous people and in, I could do some more here, in these uh, 25 verses, he will talk about who's righteous five times, this will be in some verses beyond um, verse 29 that you're seeing here. And um, they talk about uh, being led away. And then he gives the first three of five, uh, first three of nine examples of being led. And then the last one, um, they uh, talk about his words. And Nephi is going to talk about the power of God's words 10 times in this speech that he gives. So it's actually a very tightly constructed speech that responds to his brother's comments, or at least Nephi's summary of his brother's complaints. I'm going to move now to intertextuality. Um, when Nephi recounts the history of Israel in this, in this speech in chapter 17, he's following precedence. There are several instances in the Bible where famous figures deliver lengthy speeches at key narrative transitions, which often include recitals of Israelite history. So, for example, I talked about the Deuteronomistic history before, but in there, Joshua's farewell at Joshua 24, he's going to tell the story of Israel again. Um, and Samuel does the same at his farewell at 1 Samuel 12. 
Solomon's temple dedication prayers at 1 Kings 8. Um, don't quite do the same thing with telling the history of Israel, but he he refers, alludes to, to various incidents that have happened in their past. And then also um, Stephen's last words in Acts uh, um, uh, 7, which uh, sort of like Nephi's words, um, ends with a condemnation of his hearers. I mean, in this case, it's going to be something parallel rather than a, a precedent, since I, I doubt that Nephi knew very much about Acts or, or, or Stephen. But again, there's more. Because Latter-day Saints don't know the Bible very well, we often miss subtle connections between the two books. And, um, um, for instance, at 1 Nephi 17.26, there's a nondescript phrase that's easy to pass over. I've highlighted there. Um, you, you know that Moses was commanded of the Lord to do that great work. And, and he continues on. Sharp-eyed readers may catch it as a rebuttal to Nephi's brothers, where earlier um, they'd started to, um, Nephi had started to build a ship and then it was getting difficult. And then they said, we knew that you couldn't do that. Thou canst not, canst not accomplish so great a work. So you can hear a little echo there. But actually, if you look through the scriptures, the, the exact phrase, that great work, only occurs one other time in, in all of scripture. And its other occurrence is highly relevant to Nephi's message um, in chapter 17. This is where it shows up in Exodus 4, 14. So when Nephi is saying, uh, Moses was commanded the Lord to do that great work, and then he goes on to say, that great work is, let's see, the Red Sea was divided, the Israelites passed through on dry ground, and the Egyptians were drowned. Um, he actually apparently has this in mind, where Exodus 14, where that great work is defined as Israel walks on dry land, the waters were divided, a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left, and then the Egyptians were drowned in the sea. So it's just one little short phrase, but if you know where it comes from, it actually has, has a, a lot of, of resonance, a lot of significance. And even though, here's some more intertextuality, even though the stories that Nephi tells are familiar, he sometimes tells them with a twist. How exactly did Moses work miracles? And in the Book of Mormon, he does so by speaking. So Nephi says, here it is, uh, Moses was commanded of the Lord to do that great work. And you know that by his word, the word, the waters of the Red Sea were divided hither and thither. And then a, a next verse, next two verses, Moses by his word smote the rock and there came forth water. But when you look back at what the Hebrew Bible says, Exodus says, that's not exactly how it was first described. You, you may remember in Exodus 14, um, God tells Moses, lift up thy rod and stretch out thy hands. And Moses stretched out his hand, and then God caused the sea to go back. So in, when, when Nephi tells this story, he doesn't talk about a rod. It's just a, or a, or a gesture. It's actually just the, the, the speaking. And that's what it's like in Exodus 17 as well. God says, um, thy rod, take in thy hand and go, and I will stand before thee, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall water come out of it. But with Nephi, there's no, there's some smiting of the rock, but there's no, no rod. It's, uh, it seems to happen by Moses's word. Nephi is really interested in, in divinely empowered words. And so when he tells these stories, that's kind of what he brings up to the forefront. And this isn't just a, a, a one-off thing that happens in a couple of verses in chapter 17. Earlier on in 1 Nephi chapter 4, when Nephi again is referring to Moses, he says, let us go up, be strong like unto Moses, for truly he spake unto the waters of the Red Sea, and they, they divided hither and thither, and our fathers came through out of captivity on dry ground. The armies of the Pharaoh did follow and were drowned in the waters of the sea. But once again, Nephi doesn't mention a rod there. Um, here's an example of, of that mixes carefully crafted words and intertextuality. For people who know the Bible well, the word in 1 Nephi 17, uh, 30 is ominous. This is when uh, Nephi is talking about the children of Israel who reviled against Moses and against the true and living God. If you remember the most egregious example of this kind of complaining against, against Moses and God in the Bible, what comes next is the story of the brass serpents. Right, so, so you may, here it is. The people spoke against God and against Moses, and then God sent fiery serpents. Um, but up here, 
in in verse 30, um, Nephi uses this language, reviled against uh, against Moses and against God, but then he sort of leaves leaves things off, leaves off the story. Um, but actually, he doesn't entirely leave it off. He waits. Um, he holds back for 10 more verses before allowing the other shoe to drop. So if you hear reviled against Moses and God and say, what about the fiery serpents? Eventually, so in, in verse 40, Nephi is going to get to the, the fiery flying serpents. Um, in his retelling of the brass plate story that follows, he adds something new, as many LDS scholars have noted, that there were some people who refused to even look at this, the serpentine image. What's been less noticed, however, is that the brass serpent incident is retold four more times in the Book of Mormon, and each time a Nephite prophet will add something new to the original story. It sort of builds on itself through the, through the entire Book of Mormon. This brings us to my third point, the th third thing I wish everyone knew, which is about salvation history. What comes between this initial allusion to the brass plate story in verse 30, and then when you get a, 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 a quick retelling of it um, in verse 40, what comes between is a reinterpretation of salvation history. And remember, that's God's interve intervention in history on behalf of nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, um, as the Book of Mormon so often puts it, borrowing a phrase from, from Revelation. So look here at um, uh, 1 Nephi 17, 32 through 35. Nephi is interpreting the conquest of the Canaanites <clears throat> that's described in the book of Joshua. And, and Nephi is describing it as God's judgment um, on the Canaanites due to their wickedness, right? And do you suppose that the, so they, they drove the children of the land, they drove out the children of the land, that's the Canaanites, even scattering them, and now do you suppose that the children of this land, the Canaanites, who were in the land of promise, who were driven out by our fathers, do you suppose that they were righteous? Behold, I say unto you, nay. Um, as he does that, he's going to sort of imply that the children of Israel, in contrast, were actually righteous. So the Lord is seen with all flesh in one. He that is righteous is favored of, of God. And the Lord cursed the land to the Canaanites um, uh, because of their wickedness. But he did bless it unto our fathers, unto their obtaining power over it. But when Nephi tells that story, it's actually a little, it's its quite different than, than, what it, uh, than how the story is told, or at least foreshadowed, in, um, in the book of Deuteronomy, which specifically rejects the idea that Nephi is putting forward here. So this is Moses on the plains of Moab talking to the children of Israel right before they're going to go into Canaan uh, for the warfare that's going to happen there. And uh, Moses says, speak not in thine heart. Um, don't say, for my righteousness, the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. And then he repeats it. Not for thy righteousness or the uprightness of thy house, does that, of thy heart, dost thou go to possess their land. Um, Moses is saying, you're going to conquer the Canaanites, but don't think that it's because you're righteous, because you're not that righteous. Actually, Deuteronomy chapter 9 goes on to castigate the, the Israelites for their stubbornness and rebelliousness in the wilderness. And then Moses says, actually, the reason this is going to happen is not because you're so righteous, but because your ancestors were righteous. Um, and then he, it, it, it brings in this idea of inherited blessings, that the Lord had made covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are going to be the beneficiaries of those covenants, even though you're not so great yourself. This contradiction between the way Nephi thinks about salvation history and the way that, that it's, it, it's uh, portrayed, depicted in Deuteronomy, raises some difficult questions. As a contemporary American who prizes freedom and individualism, I'm uncomfortable with talk about blessings and curses that come upon groups. I don't like collective punishments or advantages. I hesitate to ascribe theological significance to political events. Yet the Book of Mormon, written for our day, often speaks in these terms. Perhaps it was meant, at least in part, as a corrective to modern individualism or, or hyper-individualism. It takes just a few moments of reflection to come up with ways in which people's lives are constrained and, and sometimes enriched by the circumstances of their birth things like race and gender and social class or nationality. How much of that 
does God take into account? And what are our social responsibilities as opposed to our individual responsibilities? So these are some grown up questions that come up. How responsible are we for the society in which we live? How much responsibility do individual members bear for actions of the church as a whole? Is there a place for collective guilt or, and punishment or collective repentance? Um, there's sometimes in Protestantism, there's this idea that it's that that salvation is just a personal relationship with with Christ, with the Savior. It's kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing. And that and that's a that's something that Nephi and Lehi have been hearing, but they're also very much tied to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament that talks about these, these sort of collective forms of responsibility. A couple more. Are inherited blessings still a thing? How much do we benefit from, say, faithful parents or grandparents? Or maybe even going back to the pioneers for people who have pioneer ancestry in Utah or, or people who live in, in other countries whose pioneer ancestors could be much, much more closer to them in, uh, in, in a genealogical chart. When we talk about the dangers of pride, might that include self-righteousness? Nephi just sort of assumes, oh, the children of Israel are righteous and the Canaanites are wicked. That's kind of a simplification, maybe an oversimplification. Is that a problem? Did even Nephi get some things wrong or perhaps speak from a limited understanding to, to cut him a little bit of slack? These are, these are more grown-up questions and discussions to have that come out of, that come out of the text. And what are we to make of Nephi himself? He made two sets of plates by commandment. What we're currently reading in 1 Nephi chapter 19 that I put up, put up here um, is his second draft um, that he made 30 to 40 years after his family's fright, flight from Jerusalem. So he says, the Lord commanded me where I, where I did, I, wherefore I did make plates of ore. This is gonna be the large plates. And then he says, and he knew not at the time I made them that I should be commanded of the Lord to make these plates. He's talking about the small plates. And after I'd made these plates by way of commandment, the small plates, I received a commandment that I should put a lot more spiritual things on those. I'm paraphrasing. Wherefore, I, Nephi, did, I have to go back for a minute. Wherefore, I, Nephi, did make a record upon the other plates, which gives an account, right, of wars and contentions. Those are the large plates. An account of my making of these plates, the small plates, will be given hereafter. It's actually not until 2 Nephi chapter 5 that Nephi tells us, oh, this is when God told me to make this, this, this other uh, set of plates. Um, what we see here is, is Nephi is a writer. He's also an editor, juggling a couple of uh, uh, different drafts of sets of plates. He's also a major character in the story. There really isn't anything like this in the Bible, this sort of very active narrator and, and editor. And it adds an extra layer of complexity to the narration. Um, for me, one of my favorite examples is it, it's more like Odysseus stories in the Odyssey. Um, this isn't Nephi tied to the mast. Uh, this is Odysseus. You may remember this story where he's gonna, they're gonna um, sail and there's the sirens that are there singing their song. Odysseus really wants to hear it but he knows it's dangerous, so he plugs his men's ears with wax. Does this sound familiar? So they can roll along, but his ears are not plugged, so he can hear their song and then live to tell about it. Tell about it. Um, this is a famous story. Um, there's also a story later on about the, the Cyclops, blinding the Cyclops. If you remember a lot of mythology, there's a story about um, uh, surviving uh, Scylla and Charybdis, two monsters that he survives twice. Okay, we're hearing these stories in the Odyssey, but actually, it's not Homer that's telling these stories. It's Odysseus himself who's telling these stories um, in, the, in, the, in the court of, of Alcinous, um, who's the king of the, the Phaeacians. Um, what happens, this, I'd like this, this image, this portrait, is um, there's been a singer, he's been entertaining them with some songs about the Trojan War. The singer starts talking about Odysseus, and Odysseus starts to cry when he hears his own name here and they say, who are you? And he says, I'm Odysseus. And then he tells them all the adventures that have happened to him in the last 10 years. So this is Odysseus retelling these stories. But by this point of the story, we already know that Odysseus is a smooth talker who is sometimes a little bit free with the truth. And we also know that he wants something from these people. He wants a ship. He wants them to give him a ship so he can sail back home. 
And he tells these stories, these heroic stories about fighting monsters and such, in part because the people he's talking to are not heroic. Um, the Phaeacians, they say their real skills are not fighting. Um, it's um, taking naps and warm baths is sort of their pleasure in life. So he's telling these, these wild stories. Okay, back to Nephi. There's all of these stories that and some of you read about in chapter 16 and chapter 19, where Nephi is confronting his brothers, etc. But this isn't Nephi telling these stories in real time or even re this. What we've actually got is the middle aged ne Nephi who's remembering things from his teenage years, reflecting back on those incidents. And then he's telling these stories to us in a particular way, because like Odysseus, he wants something from his leaders not his leaders, his readers. And, and what he wants, he's actually quite upfront about his agenda. Back in 1 Nephi chapter 6, he said, for the fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. Okay, does that agenda that he has color the way that he tells these stories? And what about us? Does our storytelling vary with our audience? What do we see in hindsight? that might have been invisible to us at the time, especially when we're thinking about the spiritual contours of our lives. When are we able to see God's hands in our lives and when not? And, and sometimes it's hard to tell until later on, but that's a, that's a very grown-up kind of discussion to have coming again out of the Book of Mormon, which brings us to two chapters from Isaiah. Okay, the, this is the formatting that I've done. So, um, here, the, the Roman numeral six refers to the original chapter that started there. Um, and then there's a little bit of an introduction that Nephi gives. And then there's a super header that says, we're going to see two chapters where Nephi is going to quote Isaiah 48 and 49. And then we'll, this is the our current chapter 20, which is going to start here. And then I've also marked out some of the most of the changes between the Book of Mormon text and the King James Bible. And I've, I've highlighted those in, in bold. Okay, so there's a lot going on here, but I'm trying to help you make sense of it through my formatting. Nephi is going to set the scene for these Isaiah chapters by telling us that he was reading to his brothers from the brass plates. Okay, I know that second Isaiah is a, is a problem. It's an, it's an anachronism, um, as is the direct borrowing from the King James Version, but that's how, that's how the text works. So we're just going to go with that. What I want to call to your attention here is the idea of likening scriptures to ourselves. Latter-day Saints usually treat this phrase in a sort of adolescent way. We want to know, how can this story or verse be applied to my life? What's its message for me? How does it help me with my concerns and my struggles? It, it's all about me. In contrast, however, Nephi takes what I think is a more grown-up approach. His religiosity is less about himself and more about God. So, so these two Isaiah chapters are about salvation history. Likening the scriptures unto us doesn't mean, let's see what God has, can do for, for me, for us, but rather it's finding our place in God's plan for humanity. It's about his priorities and his purposes. And that's what Nephi is looking for here, is in this this grand story of God's working through peoples and nations and communities, where might our family fit, fit into that? Um, here's a quick reminder of what I'm hoping to show you um, in 1 Nephi chapters 16 through 22, um, right? Carefully crafted intertextuality, salvation history, uh, grown-up discussions. Um, I'm going to look at a, a few combinations of one through four before I move on to the last point about hearing Jesus's voice. Um, and then with that, let, let's dive into Isaiah, which is everybody's favorite anyways. Okay, the two Isaiah chapters quoted in 1 Nephi are mostly taken from the King James translation of the Bible with occasional modifications um, that don't seem to change the meaning very much. But every so often, there are differences that do seem significant. And here the words in bold have been added, the words that I've put in bold have been added to Isaiah. There are three scattered branches of Israel specifically mentioned. One coming back to the Holy Land from the north that you can see. This is in, in verse 12. See if my I can make my pointer work here. Here it is. From the north, another from the west, and then a third group uh, from the land of Sinim, which refers to As Aswan in southern Egypt, so from the south. 
So we've got three of the four cardinal directions are mentioned, right? North, west, and south. And then in the Book of Mormon, there's a, a line that's added for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established. And these mysterious people from the east will complete that set of cardinal directions. And that sort of brings the verse, the verses into line with Zenos's prophecy, which was co quoted in 1 Nephi chapter 19, where Zenos says, all the people over the house of Israel, where they gather in, uh, he says, says Zenos, from the four quarters of the earth. So it's sort of nice that you've got this, this four directions, four quarters thing going. Um, um, and then there are implications, according to 1 Nephi 19, for not that this is not going to be a great thing just for Israel, but all the earth shall see the salvation of, of the Lord, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then this added phrase up here, for they shall be smitten no more after they're gathered, indicates a time frame in the latter days, rather than just the return of some Jews to Jerusalem in 538 BCE, after Cyrus and the Persians conquered the ba Babylonians. Um, there was a, a lot of smiting of the Jews in the centuries after Cyrus, uh, tragically. The additional lines that recontextualize Isaiah's prophecy into a wider geographical and a, and a wider chronological scale are rather subtle, but clearly there's a mind at work here. Someone, whether it was Nephi or Joseph Smith, is reading and revising Isaiah in careful, creative words. And I don't know how you would ever see that unless I was showing you where the differences come in. It's actually, it's actually pretty smoothly done. Um, Nephi talks to his, uh, he talks, he takes his brothers and his readers through Isaiah 48 through 49, and then he adds a chapter of commentary. This is chapter 22, in which he interprets and weaves together the phrases from Isaiah and Zenos that he's just quoted. So you can see I've, I've put these phrases that he's just quoted from the previous uh, two or three chapters into bold, and then I've showed you where they come from. So this phrase comes from Isaiah, this one, a couple from Zenos, um, et cetera. Um, and then he's actually going to work in some phrases from his own vision in, in chapters 11 through 14. It's an impressive prophetic performance as Nephi integrates his own revelations with the scriptural heritage of Israel found on the brass plates. And then you can see toward the end here, it talks about the Gentiles will do this and that. The Gentiles will, will have a role in the events he describes. Um, but when Nephi talks about the gathering of Israel, he seems to have in mind literal migrations of people in the last days rather than just conversions through missionary work. As verse six says, um, he says, um, these things of which he spoke are temporal, which means they're part of salvation history. They're, they're going to be something that's going to be in, in, in global history. Yet conversions are part of the story. Um, here you can see uh, a little later on here, this is still in chapter 22 when he's sort of recapping um, what he gets out of uh, interpreting, what he gets from these Isaiah chapters. In verse 11, uh, wherefore God will proceed to make Oh, well, let's start here. Um, in verse 10, he says, um, all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed unless he shall make bare his arm in the eyes of the nations, which is a quote from Isaiah. It's not from the Isaiah he's just quoted, but it's a famous quote from Isaiah. And then he, he's going to tell you what that phrase means. Wherefore, the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. So you can see there's there's some conversions going on. Um um, and then, but once again, there's a, there's a shift. Nephi is doing some creative things. Um, in verse 12, Nephi is going to make this knowledge that's going to come. They shall know the Lord as their Savior and the Redeemer. He's going to make that knowledge um, the result of, of, of seeing God's kindness in gathering, um, um, gathering Israel. But the original context of this from, from Isaiah, and this is one he's just quoted a little bit, I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. It's pretty grim, I know. And all flesh, here it is, shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. So where Jacob says this knowledge of the Lord is going to come from watching the destruction of your enemies, Nephi says this knowledge of the world of, of the Lord is going to come from seeing Israel brought out of captivity and gathered together in the lands of their inheritance. Um, he he's he's basically um, he, he's shifted the focus from justice to mercy. Also, the word again in verse twelve, if we can get that, he will bring them again out of captivity. 
Um, that presupposes an earlier liberation from bondage, um, probably not in Egypt, but this probably refers to the return from the Babylonian exile. So it's another indication that Nephi is reinterpreting Isaiah's original prophecies as having an application in the, in the last days, in addition to, to whatever they meant for the 6th century BCE. Um, and then the plural, um, they will be gathered together to the lands of their inheritance. Um, that's significant, given Book of Mormon teachings about multiple promised lands. So sometimes individual words matter a great deal in how we make sense of the meaning and the theology um, that, that Nephi is trying to convey to us. From the time they left Jerusalem, Nephi and Lehi received remarkable revelations about the plan of salvation. Again, that's the coming Messiah, his atonement for the sins of individuals, the inevitable judgment day, and the possibility of eternal life. Nephi, in particular, struggles to reconcile these new theological concepts with his traditional understanding of salvation history. And he does so by reading scriptures, the brass plates, as carefully as he can. He concludes chapter 22, and then that's going to conclude 1 Nephi, by asking his brothers to recognize the compatibility of his revelations, his and Lehi's revelations, with the words of the prophets he's just quoted. I would that ye should consider the things which have been written upon the brass plates are true, and ye need not suppose that I and my father are the only ones that have testified and also taught them. He says the things that Lehi and I have been saying are actually, they're in, they work well with what you've known for your whole life um, from the, the Deuteronomistic history, from Isaiah. Um, they work together. And Christ is going to be the center of both of those modes of salvation, both as the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, and then also as the, the, the Savior who would, who would come to earth and, 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 and uh, redeem our sins on the cross. Um, and then he's going to end, um, Nephi's going to end with a couple of callbacks to earlier material. Let's see. Okay. Um, all these things are according to the flesh, um, which answers his brother's questions at the beginning of chapter 22 about the scope of the Isaiah chapters. Um, so he's read the Isaiah, and then they have some questions, and they said, are they to be understood according to the things which are spiritual, which will come to pass in the spirit and not the flesh? Um, and Nephi says, no, it's going to be according to the flesh. So it's not just conversions in individual hearts. There's, these are going to be world historical events that are going to happen. And then finally, one more down here. Um, when Nephi was introducing the Isaiah chapters, he tells his brothers, I want you to hear the words of the prophet, which were written unto all the house of Israel, and liken them unto yourselves that ye may have hope. And I think in the very sort of the last sentence of his summation in chapter 22, he says to his brothers, if ye shall be obedient to the commandments and endure to the end, ye shall be saved at the last day, which actually sounds kind of hopeful to me. I think he's sort of making good on what he was hoping that, to give them through his long quotations from Isaiah. Um, so we finally come to my last point, which is about, um, which, which is that we can hear Jesus's voice in the Book of Mormon. This would be more subjective than, than simply highlighting repeated phrases or biblical expressions. But here's what I think is happening in the last chapters of 1 Nephi. For Nephi, life in the Promised Land did not turn out as he had expected. When he was a teenager and had seen so many miracles, he hoped that his family would be a righteous branch of Israel, staying true to, the, to both the old covenants and also the new astonishing revelations that he and his father had received. He hoped that they would be a, a righteous branch in, in a new promised land. But now, writing in middle age, he sees mostly failure. After Lehi's death, the family quickly split apart with such enmity that they were actually trying to kill each other. Nephi's brothers have already abandoned the faith, and he knew that his own descendants would eventually follow suit and be wiped out. In his time of despair, when he's trying to reconcile his life with, with what he thought should happen according to the scriptures and the covenants, in that time, he turns to the scriptures, which he understands differently in his 50s than he did when he was a, a, a teenager. As Nephi diligently studies the brass plates, trying to make sense of his painful experiences, and trying to figure out how his disappointing life might fit into God's plans, he's inspired to update some of Isaiah's prophecies. And in this slide, you can see a number of small textual modifications to Isaiah 48 that shift the focus from a political figure 
who would take vengeance on the Babylonians and allow Jews to return to Jerusalem. That's usually considered to be Cyrus the Great. So you're going to shift from this political figure to a new prophet who would declare God's word to the people. So look at what's being added here. In verse 14, um, all you assemble, okay, who among them hath declared these things unto them? The Lord hath loved them, and here's a whole line, yea, and he will fulfill his word, which he hath declared by them, that them should probably be by him. I had a conversation with Royal Skousen two days ago about that. So declared by them, and then down here, um, thus saith the Lord, um, I have called him to, not called him to, to destroy um, uh, the, the, the Canaan, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, but I've called him to declare, so there's somebody else here, and from the time that it was declared, I have spoken. And then in the original, and the Lord God and his spirit has sent me, and thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, and then an added thing, I've sent him. This seems to refer to a, a, a prophet. Um, and, and a key, um, let's see if I can get to the right place here. Um, ah. Okay, I'm going to shift to another slide. Um, when... He, when Nephi gets to um, Isaiah 49, there's a whole passage that's inserted at the beginning that places Isaiah's words in the context of Lehi's allegory of the olive tree, where branches of Israel are broken off and scattered throughout the world. So you can see this, all uh, hearken, O ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off, driven out because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people, broken off, scattered abroad, etc. Um, Nephi would have seen his family in these verses. They're part of Israel that's been broken off. But this new material that's been added um, is actually quite similar to the opening of, of Jeremiah chapter 23. You can see the pastors um, have scattered the sheep and the Lord God says against the pastors, you've scattered my flock, driven them away, driven. Um, um, actually, Jeremiah is the only writer in the Old Testament who uses the word pastor, at, at least in the King James Version. So, so there's a there's a connection that you might, uh, more of a connection that you might suspect. And then down here um, in Jeremiah, there's going to be more about uh, gathering uh, later in the chapter. And, it, and Nephi is going to pick that up um, later in some chapters. But look what comes next. So I'm going to be in chapter 21 of 1 Nephi, and they're quoting Isaiah 49. And we get um, this. Um, in the verses that follow... Isaiah describes a frustrated, discouraged prophet. So this is the prophet, and it seems to be this, this prophetic figure that, that has been, or, or this it follows the reinterpretation in the previous uh, chapter. Um, in verse 4, then I said, this is the prophet speaking, I have labored in vain. I have spent my, my strength for naught and in vain. Uh, those are definitely the words of, of discouragement. And this prophet both is Israel and he also gathers Israel. So in verse three, thou art my servant, O Israel. And then in, in uh, five, uh, that I should be his servant to bring Jacob, to bring Israel again unto him. But Israel has not been gathered. You can see in verse five, though Israel be not gathered. Um, but if even if Israel hasn't been gathered yet, God has another glorious mission for his spokesman. You can see, I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And this, this new additional mission is for this, this, this prophet to be a light to the Gentiles and bring salvation to all humanity. It is down in verse six. It is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. Like that's important, but there's, there's something even bigger. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends, ends of the earth. Um, I think Nephi would have seen himself in these verses, especially later in his life when he realized that despite his failures to pursue many of his closest relatives, his discouragements, his frustrations. It's his writings in the Book of Mormon that would someday be a blessing to the Gentiles and would result in worldwide conversions. This, I believe, is the voice of the Lord to Nephi and perhaps to us as well. God is faithful, but his promises won't always be fulfilled in the ways that we expect. There may be serious frustrations and disappointments, but we will be blessed in ways that we can scarcely imagine if we continue to say, my judgment is with the Lord, that's in verse four, and my God shall be my strength, in verse five. 
God is always true to his promises, but not in ways that we expect. A key element to this kind of spiritual consolation and understanding, however, is to read the scriptures as carefully as we possibly can, like Nephi. Unfortunately, as Latter-day Saints, we're not very good at this. We tend to quote a few favorite verses and stories and then quickly relate them to something that happened to us once or that we heard in general conference. So to recap, here are the five things that I wish everyone knew about the Book of Mormon. And I've tried to give you something of an answer to the question that the Stanford uh, student asked, who said, what are we missing when we read the Book of Mormon? These are the kinds of things that we're missing. Now, some of you may be saying, sure, you found some interesting things for this week in Come Follow Me, but what about next week? Oh, um, I'm pretty sure that I could do a similar presentation for 2 Nephi chapters 1 and 2 and for every week thereafter because I've already done it. Almost all of the observations that I've made this morning can be found in my annotated Book of Mormon, which was published by Oxford University Press last September. It's like an academic study Bible, but for the Book of Mormon. And it's modeled, as, it, as it's said in the introduction, it's modeled on the New Oxford Annotated Bible. The formatting of the two books is pretty similar um, with scriptural, a scriptural text at the top of each page and then annotations at the bottom pointing out literary, historical, and theological features. There are introductions to individual books along with general essays that situate the Book of Mormon in various scholarly conversations. The Annotated Book of Mormon was written with an academic audience in mind. So when I highlight the kinds of intricate connections that I've shared this morning, my point isn't to try to convince people that the book is true. That's, that's not the point of academic writing. Rather, I want to persuade readers that the Book of Mormon is better than, than they think it is. Whether you're a church member or an outsider, a non-member, whether you believe the book is ancient or a product of the 19th century, it's better than you think it is. And for those who accept the Book of Mormon as a revelation of some sort, as authoritative scripture, there's a lot to work with in this strange, wonderful text. I was also hoping to teach Latter-day Saints how to be better readers of scripture. I don't want to sound ungrateful to have been invited here or ungrateful to all of you who have turned, who have tuned in, but podcasts, including this one, are a terrible way to study scripture. Listening to someone talk for 30 or 60 minutes about one of our standard works is not nearly as valuable as actually engaging with the, with the scripture itself, preferably in a reader-friendly edition. You need, to you need to read carefully and repeatedly, turning pages back and forth, looking for connections, trying to make sense of every verse, every sentence in context. My annotations call attention to a few representative observations, but there's still so much more to see and to discover. We just need better models for how to do this well. My own scripture reading has been immeasurably enriched by good study Bibles, such as the Harper Collins Study Bible and Robert Alter's three volumes translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Rabbinical Assembly's Etz Hayim Torah and Commentary, which is probably my favorite of all, and the new Oxford Annotated Bible. When I spend time with these volumes, and I actually spent a lot of time with them, I find that I can return to my LDS scriptures with fresh eyes and new things to look for. Oddly enough, for all of our talk about the Book of Mormon, I think it remains a seriously underutilized resource in our religious tradition. Okay, these are some of my favorite study Bibles. Another one, another favorite is um, the Jewish Study Bible that's also published by Oxford. Um, I have often been inspired by the way it combines the best of critical historical scholarship with a deep reverence for its role as a sacred text within a faith community. At the conclusion of the editor's introduction, um, they write, quote, as we have worked on the Bible for the last three years, um, we have gained an even greater respect and appreciation for the gift of the Bible and for the never-ending, ever-renewing Jewish interpretive traditions. We share with even more profound conviction that sentiment of the psalmist, oh, how I love your teaching. It is my study all day long. That's my testimony 
of the Book of Mormon as well. Oh, how I love your teaching. It is my study all day long. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Grant, for helping us to, um, to reframe, rethink um, the possibilities of study in the Book of Mormon to give us kind of a primer in in how we can um, how we can do that and find all sorts of grown up discussions. <laughs> um, and please join us uh, for another gospel study lesson on February 11th with uh, Kristen Blair. And we'll go ahead and close with uh, a prayer by Blair Hodges. Um, and then um, folks who are uh, live here on Zoom, please stick around uh, and we'll have a little bit of that grown up discussion with you. Dear God, we're grateful for this opportunity this Sabbath morning to gather together through a virtual ward of sorts and talk about the Book of Mormon. We're thankful for Grant Hardy for spending his time sharing insights from his research. We are grateful for the gift of the Book of Mormon and the messages that it can convey through careful study and research. We're grateful for scholars who consecrate their intellectual and spiritual abilities to help shed light on the text today. Uh, and we're grateful for all the efforts to help continue bringing the Book of Mormon out of obscurity. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.